from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. It is a tough thing to admit, yet a necessary thing to prioritize. A suicide crisis has rocked the San Antonio Police Department. Within a year and a half, the department says eight active and retired San Antonio police officers took their own lives. Our Danielle Ibarra shows us how the department is working with officers who are experiencing trauma. On the worst days of someone's life, San Antonio police officers are there. They've dealt with situations that can be tough to process. And then there are times where they're going to be like, you know what, I don't... Sergeant Tina Barron says when she first joined the department, peer support was unheard of. Having a discussion to say that we were on the job, we had a call, it was a critical incident, and it's just not really sitting well with me, and I need to kind of take a minute to sit back and think about it or process it before I go to the next call. Man, we just didn't do that. The department added more resources in 2011. A few years later, the department was hit with a suicide crisis. It impacted a lot of us in a lot of different ways, and we lost some guys in numbers that we just had never seen before. In 2021, San Antonio police say two officers took their own lives. The next year, in 2022, that number jumped up to a total of six officers. For active duty, two retirees. We got to a point where uh, we had to do something different. It's why SAPD created the Wellness Unit. It helps officers connect with mental health resources. Yeah, officers to... like Gabriel Mendoza check in with those who might need help. Sometimes you'll get uh, individuals that are a little bit more emotional uh, than others, um, some that are a little bit more disengaged. To help others open up. Yeah, we don't wear uniforms, we, we dress down. Mendoza says he has to be vulnerable too. I've had those bad days. I've had those dark times and and I think that a lot of us experience them and a lot of us don't talk about our story. Sergeant Barron adds that being there for officers helps them better serve the community. For us though, to give our best when we're out in the community, it's important for us within ourselves to give each other our best. Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. An important story there. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health or thoughts of suicide, help is available. You can call or text 988 to find resources. New on the night beat, the medical examiner has identified a man that died earlier this week while trying to help someone change a flat tire. 63-year-old Mauro Mendoza Santos stopped on the side of 281 South near Hildebrand late Thursday night to help that stranded driver. Shortly after stopping, he was hit and pronounced dead. The crash has been ruled accidental. A vigil for Santos is scheduled for tomorrow evening. A 15-year-old critical in the hospital after being shot in the head late last night. And San Antonio police say they already have arrested one of the people they believe was involved. Police say 20-year-old Zakhar Polk shot at the car with the teen and the mother inside in the 9900 block of West Military Drive. The teen's mother drove away from the scene and called 911. Police were able to track down Polk hours later and arrested him. They say there's still one more suspect out there. If you know anything that could help them, call SAPD immediately. That number on our website, ksat.com. Now to Russia, where at least 133 people have died in that massive terrorist attack on one of Moscow's largest concert venues. All four gunmen involved yesterday have been arrested near the Russia-Ukraine border. Seven more suspects have also been detained and are being labeled as accomplices in that attack. In the 24 hours since, ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack, and Vladimir Putin has suggested the attackers were trying to escape to Ukraine, something U.S. intelligence officials in Kyiv have denied. Well, San Antonio defense attorney says that the Bear County District Attorney's Office dragged its feet for months in handing over evidence and was untruthful about its reasons for dismissing a DWI charge against a key witness in her client's prostitution case. Records show an elevated DWI charge against that woman was dismissed last year, despite her having a blood alcohol limit nearly three times the legal limit and at least five pretrial violations. While prosecutors have told attorney Carolyn Wetland into the, dismiss the dismissal had nothing to do with the woman's prior testimony, KSAT investigates obtained records that appear to dispute that claim. There was a lot of manipulation of the system in this case. In about 20 minutes, KSAT takes a closer look at the case and what impact this revelation could have at trial.
Hundreds of people marched downtown San Antonio this morning to mark the 28th annual Cesar Chavez March for Justice. Chavez inspired generations of Latinos through his life's work as a civil rights leader. People marched two miles from the historic Guadalupe Theater down to Hemisphere Park to honor Chavez and the groundwork he laid for Latinos all across America. The Chavez Legacy and Educational Foundation organizes the march each year, and they wrapped it up a little while ago at Brook City Base with a gala where one of our very own KSAT reporters was the center of attention. She is a San Antonio staple that we are proud to call a colleague and friend. Jesse DeGollado has served her community for decades through journalism. And now the Chavez Legacy and Educational Foundation is recognizing her for her years of hard work and dedication. Jesse is the recipient of the foundation's 2023 Aguila Lifetime Achievement Award. Her work in the field as a reporter has stood the test of time. Our Stephanie Serna looks back on Jesse's Hall of Fame career. Curiosity and my love for the written word combined to become my desire to be a reporter. Born and raised in Laredo, Jessie Degollado says being a reporter was a dream she had ever since she was a little girl. My mother, in fact, told me, Ay, mijita, you're going to starve. You're going to starve, my little girl. You're going to starve. Well, I told her, Mom, I don't think so, but you'll see. You'll see. Jessie is a pioneer when it comes to Latinas pursuing a career in journalism. Her journey began in 1977 in the Valley and eventually made her way to Quesa in 1984. And she's been here ever since, covering countless stories. In Piedras Negras, in Uvalde County, in Monterrey, from the Davis Mountains in far west Texas, at the presidential residence Los Pinos in Mexico City, at the papal site near Denver. Jesse has been honored by the Cesar Chavez Legacy and Educational Foundation, Catholic Television of San Antonio, and the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists. She has even been inducted into the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame. I was just the girl from Laredo, Texas, that made it in the valley and was blessed to come to San Antonio, and I've been here as long as I have. And so for that, I am proud. Jesse says when she started out in the business, the landscape was much different. 20, 30 years ago when I started, it was a very much male-dominated world. She says a lot has changed, including the role of Latinas and women in general. Now we have women who are in charge, making decisions, and helping running the show. When it comes to young women wanting to pursue a career in journalism, Jesse has a few words of advice. First, ask yourself, why do I want to do this? How much do I want to do this? Is it something that I'm willing to commit to? She says those are the most important questions you need to ask yourself because this business can be very demanding. Also, sometimes relationships and families can suffer because they don't understand what we do. And sometimes it takes 24 hours a day and Jesse's journey isn't over yet. She'll continue telling the stories that matter to you most, impacting people right here in San Antonio and inspiring more young Latinas to follow in her footsteps. Just know that you really do have it in you. If you want it bad enough, you do have it in you and it will come out. Stephanie Serna. Case at 12 News. Oh, we are so lucky to have Jesse. I remember, you know, a lot of the thing, things Stephanie mentioned about her champion women, yeah. championing, championing women. I remember when I got here a while ago, she was one of the, my main cheerleaders who really encouraged me. It's and amazing. It's, and she's really run, one of the storytellers that taught me and so many other people that you can still have emotion and also you know, tell the stories of the people around you is just incredible. She is such a wonderful role model in the newsroom. She comes off as just a wonderful person on camera, and that is so incredibly true with just how she is as a person. Yeah. I feel like she's our little ray of sunshine around <laughs> the newsroom, is. and she just embodies San Antonio. She embodies KSAT, and how lucky are we to have her we as are a coworker? Very lucky. So, congratulations to Jesse. We're lucky to have you. Yes. All right, let's switch things up and let's head outside with live cams tonight.
We've seen some additional cloud cover work in this evening, and that's going to continue to build through the overnight. As we head into the back half of the weekend for our Sunday, additional humidity is going to pump in via a breezy southeast wind. Here's an early look at your Sunday forecast. Winds again out of the southeast at about 10 to 20 miles per hour sustained, gusting upwards of 30 to 35 miles per hour at times. So that's one of the big things that you're going to know notice changing for the back half of the weekend's plans. A little bit of patchy fog not completely ruled out. First thing in the morning, mostly cloudy skies, high temperatures in the low to mid 70s, so somewhat seasonable for this time of year. Now additional changes work in early Monday in the form of a spotty rain chance for some. We're going to time it out, get you a look at the future cast coming up in just a few, Courtney. Thanks, Mia. Well, crisis averted. A last second effort is keeping the government from shutting down. What went into the bill and why not all lawmakers are happy next on the Night Beat. The Senate just passed a government funding package after midnight this morning, averting a partial shutdown and ending a lengthy fight that has loomed over both sides of Capitol Hill for months. The bill could also cost Mike Johnson his job as Speaker of the House. Some conservatives are unhappy with the spending bill and one even filed a motion to vacate his speakership. Rob Kirkpatrick reports it's that same move that caused Kevin McCarthy to lose the speakership and led Republican infighting last fall. Just two hours after the midnight deadline, Congress passed a funding bill to avoid a government shutdown. This funding agreement between the White House and congressional leaders is good news that comes in the nick of time. When passed, it will extinguish any more shutdown threats for the rest of the fiscal year. President Joe Biden signed the legislation Saturday and praised the bipartisan bill, calling it, quote, good news for the American people. The $1.2 trillion funding bill addresses a slate of critical government operations, including the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, Labor, and the Legislative Branch. This is a good result for the American people. In terms of standing up for their health, their safety, their education, their national security protection, and of course, above all else, their economic well-being. But the fight is far from over, as hardline conservatives signaled an unwillingness to approve the legislation. It's a bad day for the country, for anybody that votes for this. They're funding this, uh, killing this country. The agreement could also cost Republican Mike Johnson his job as House Speaker. Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene on Friday filed a motion to vacate him as House Speaker. I filed the motion to vacate today, but it's more of a warning and a pink slip. This was our leverage. This is our chance to secure the border, and he didn't do it. Greene's resolution to oust Johnson will hang over the GOP conference as the House begins a two-week recess. I'm Rob Kirkpatrick reporting. All right, back home, it was raining eggs over Tom Slick Park this afternoon. Thousands of candy-filled Easter eggs were dropped to the park from a helicopter thanks to a partnership between the Bear County Sheriff's Office and the Northwest Chapter of Last Chance Ministries. The ministry reported on their Facebook page more than 2,500 people came out to enjoy the free and fun-filled early Easter gathering. Look at all those kids! What? Stampede! That is the, mo that's the <laughs> coolest Easter egg hunt I've ever seen! When I was new at KSAT, that was one of the things that I covered, <laughs> and I could, I was like trying to report, and I remember just being stunned about how many There's kids we're running. This guy. It's chaos in the best way. <laughs> it seems like a lot of fun, and we had nice weather yeah. for it today, it too. So, two thumbs up when it yeah. comes to the forecast for today and all those outside activities that you may have had. Now, we are going to see some changes into tomorrow. I think one of the bigger changes you're going to notice is the wind. So, wind gusts out of the southeast, upwards of about 30 to even 35 miles per hour at times, will be a common thing theme throughout the day. So right off the bat, if you still have some empty trash cans out on the sidewalk near the roads, maybe bring those in closer to the house and secure any loose lawn items just to be on the safe side. Something that those winds are going to continue to do for us over the next 24 hours, allow even more Gulf moisture to work back in.
in to South Central Texas. Dew points right now a little bit higher than where we were this time last night in the 50s for most. So still in that pleasant range, but I do think through the overnight and especially as we head into the second half of our Sunday, we will start to notice a little bit more of a muggy feel out there that could also lead to a few areas of patchy fog, maybe a sprinkle or two first thing tomorrow morning and throughout the first half of the day. Also, with that humidity returning, still mid 50s expected for most by wake up time tomorrow. Here's a look at your forecast lows by 7 a.m. Sunday, but maybe not quite as cool as what we saw earlier today. 55 out east in Gonzales, 57 for places like Nixon, Floresville, Pleasanton, Poteet, right around 56 degrees is where we are expected to start off the day here in San Antonio. A little bit cooler the farther north and west that you go. 53 in comfort as well as Sabinal stretching over to Uvalde. We are expecting the cloud cover to continue building here as we sleep tonight. Expect a cloudy start to the day tomorrow. Again, a sprinkle certainly not off the table along with some areas of patchy fog first thing in the morning. I do think the cloud cover sticks with us throughout the day a bit more so than what we saw earlier this afternoon. Mostly cloudy skies in the forecast tomorrow. 67 the forecast temperature for any lunchtime plans. We've got a high temperature topping off right around 74 by 5 p.m. Here's a look at those forecast highs in and around the San Antonio area. 73 in Canyon Lake. 71 by 4 p.m. tomorrow for places like Bulverde as well as Bernie. 77 though in Divine. So mainly along and south of the Highway 90 corridor. Mid to upper 70s will likely be a common theme as we get ready to wrap up the weekend. Additional changes work in though, especially early Monday, a brief window in between about 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. for areas north of Highway 90. We could see some spotty rain and maybe a rumble of thunder or two kickstart the day on Monday. So let's time that out. Not a whole lot going on right now here in San Antonio besides that cloud cover, but there's an area of low pressure that's approaching the four corners region that's going to continue tracking eastward here over the next couple of days and as it approaches the state of Texas into early Monday basically after midnight tomorrow night eyes are going to shift off to our northwest for a line of rain and thunderstorms that is expected to develop it's not going to be for everybody here in south central Texas because we're just catching the tail end of this activity but again in between about 5 a.m to 9 a.m on Monday for areas along and north of Highway 90, we could see some of that spotty rain develop and push through the area. So not a bad idea to take the umbrella with you if you are in those areas for the Monday morning commute. We are going to quickly, though, dry things out. Sunshine returns Monday afternoon. High temperatures rebound into the upper 70s. Then into next week, not bad. Low humidity, cool mornings, comfortable afternoons with just an isolated chance for rain on Wednesday. By the way, coming up in the next half hour, we'll talk about about how much rain we could see for those that cash into the activity on Monday, plus a recap of the rain that we saw over the past week. Courtney, you guys all know me by now. You said low humidity and I smile. Yes, <laughs> instant mood booster. It is, it really is. <laughs> You're leaving me happy. Thank Good. You. What also leaves me happy, Mary, is the Spurs results. Yes, maybe not so much tonight, but in general, yes, it's fun to see them compete. But earlier this season, the Spurs got the best of the Suns, and this time around, that script flipped. We'll show you how it all went down. Plus, Houston's head men's basketball coach, Kelvin Sampson, shares big praise for Texas A&M ahead of their round of 32 tilt. Hear what he had to say right after the break. The San Antonio Spurs host the Phoenix Suns tonight at Frost Bank Center on the heels of a two-point loss to Memphis last night. Phoenix comes into the Alamo City in need of a win as they try to avoid the play-in tournament. Opening frame, Spurs rookie Victor Wembenyama corrals the board on one end and finishes with a slam dunk on the other. Spurs get down big early. Devin Vassell with the give and go. He rams through the lane and hammers it. Second quarter now, 36-21 Suns lead. Wembenyama step back three and no doubt about that one. He can do it all. Although Phoenix led by 18 points going into halftime. 
Second half, Jeremy Sohan getting in on the two-man game with Wemby ends in another easy dunk. But there's no getting in the way of Phoenix this time. Booker hits the pull-up J. Booker having a great night. He had 32 points, nine assists, and seven rebounds. And Kevin Durant added 25 points of his own, 12 for 16 from the field and three steals for KD. And here's the final. The Spurs fall 131 to 106. Booker dropped 32. KJ led San Antonio with 14 points. Now the rematch between these two is as soon as Monday. And after the game, Blake Wesley reacted to playing a team loaded with stars like the Suns. They have three All-Stars, <laughs> three Hall of Famers. So, I mean, they're hard to guard, hard to play, but it's a good challenge for us. Uh, we get to play them on Monday too, so we'll accept the challenge. And uh, we like playing. I like playing them, so it, may, it makes me better. So. What can you guys do differently defensively to maybe make it a little bit more difficult? Huh? Uh, maybe contain contain them a little bit. Uh, I feel like forcing them more tools. Uh, they got a lot of threes up tonight, uh, scrambling, and they knock down shots. So if we contain them to more tools and uh, play the right way, defend, get on transition, I feel like we got a chance. The Texas A&M basketball team beat Nebraska 98-83 to for the Aggies' first NCAA tournament win of the Buzz Williams era. And tomorrow, with a Sweet 16 berth on the line, 8-seed Texas A&M and 1-seed Houston will meet for an in-state showdown. Houston advanced to the round of 32 by steamrolling Longwood. It'll be the second meeting of the season between these two teams. In the first matchup, the Cougars topped the Aggies 70 to 66, and Houston's head coach Kelvin Sampson acknowledged A&M will be a tough out, fueled by revenge. It's not going to be hard to motivate their kids, because they're they're going to want to come in here and and um, um, you know get some payback. But um, Texas A&M is a much much better team. Uh, today than when we played them. They're a team that can get to the Final Four. They're that good. I mean, it feels good, and we're going to try our best just to live in the moment as long as we could, but I mean, it, just like I told the team in the locker room, the job not finished, you know? Uh, yes, it feels amazing to, to win. It's an honor even to be here, you know? But we just can't get stuck on this win because we still have a, a long tournament ahead of us. As for the action that went on today, Texas versus Tennessee in the round of 32, this one went down to the wire. Tennessee went three for 25 from deep, but still managed to escape the upset by the horns. And Texas A&M Corpus Christi fell 87 to 55 to USC in the first round of the NCAA Women's Tournament. The Islanders end the season 23 and nine overall. Well, Alan Marcina and his San Antonio FC still on the hunt for their first win of the season, hosting 0-2 Colorado Springs Switchbacks FC. SCFC's best opportunity of the first half comes after a foul in the box on Jorge Hernandez. Jorge Hernandez lines up the penalty kick, but he is denied. SCFC keeps up the pressure. It rolls into the second half, and they'll finally break through in the 74th minute. Lucas Silva bags his second goal of the season and after starting the season with back-to-back -back draws, SAFC wins 2-0. Pablo Cisniaga earns the clean sheet. All right, tomorrow is the first ever San Antonio Sports All-Star Basketball game and it's taking over Northside Sports Gym as well as our KSAT 12 airwaves. We're talking about it later in the show. Can't wait. I know, it's been be so big. You guys have been prepping, so we're <laughs> yes. very excited. All right, thanks, Mary. We'll be right back after this. Did the Bear County District Attorney's Office dismiss a DWI charge in exchange for a woman's testimony in an unrelated case? A defense attorney is accusing prosecutors of being untruthful about their decision to dismiss. She also says they have not properly handed over evidence in her client's case. Case out investigates Dylan Collier walks us through the records. <laughs> In November 2017, Jarvis Anderson and his younger brother, Lawrence Jackson, were charged with human trafficking, accused of forcing two teenage girls into prostitution, a scheme investigators say was exposed after one of the girls fled from this Northside hotel and alerted her family, who then contacted police. We are not identifying her. 
while Jackson pled no contest in 2022 and was sentenced to 10 years in prison, Anderson continues to fight for his freedom. His four-count indictment reduced to two counts after prosecutors refiled the charges in late 2022. His attorney, Carolyn Wintland, argued in court this month that San Antonio police conducted a flawed investigation and evidence should be tossed, in part because officers entered and searched the hotel room without a warrant. The day's long hearing included several heated exchanges between Wintland and visiting Judge Jefferson Moore. It's in evidence, Judge, and you, you have stop, to watch it. Stop, stop, stop talking. Look, I'm not hearing or seeing anything that's relevant. Wentland telling KSAT during a break, she feels the cards have been stacked against her. Yes. Judge, it's all relevant. No, no. Take a seat then. Take a seat. I disagree. Take a seat. Wentland said the case against Anderson has been hampered by discovery issues for months, specifically that prosecutors drag their feet on handing over their correspondence with SAPD. Records confirm the second alleged victim in this case, who we are also not identifying, was accused of driving drunk when she collided with a San Antonio Fire Department ambulance in February 2021. She was unable to recite the alphabet at the scene at a blood alcohol content of 0.21, nearly three times the legal limit to drive a vehicle, racked up five pretrial violations for not calibrating her in-home alcohol monitoring device and for skipping tests, and was cited six weeks after the DWI crash on several charges, including marijuana possession, in an unrelated incident in which she was seen by police driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Despite all of these issues, her DWI case was dismissed last March. It was always, always, always told to me by the state that there had been never any agreement with, with her cooperation, that there was nothing, nothing, nothing that we needed to be aware of, that the trafficking case where she supposedly was a victim of was not connected to the dismissal, which happened on a very bad DWI. But judicial dialogue notes obtained by KSAT following a public records request tell a different story. March 6, 2023, the same day her DWI case was dismissed, a DA staffer wrote that he spoke with CH and JG, First Assistant District Attorney Christian Henriksen and District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. Quote, we all agree that the case should be dismissed. Defendant was very helpful in a human trafficking case that resulted in prison time for that defendant an apparent reference to her cooperation in the Jackson case months earlier. The staffer also noted the arresting officer in the DWI had not seen the woman driving, could not perform standard field sobriety tests, and did not get her signature on the blood draw consent form. Wintland says the prosecution was simply not truthful. It clearly indicates that there's a connection there. The DA's office did not respond to repeated requests from us about its decision to dismiss the 2021 DWI case. At last check, Judge Moore had not ruled on Wintland's motion to suppress evidence. Her client is scheduled to be back in court on Friday. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Neighbors that live in Northern Hills are all about looking out for each other, especially when it comes to crime. It's one of the biggest issues for people there what they're doing to curb it and keep their neighborhoods safe. Neighbors in Northern Hills watch out for each other. That includes looking for ways to prevent crime around the neighborhood and letting their neighbors know when crime happens. Our Daniela Ibarra shows us it's a community-wide effort that neighbors say takes all hands on deck. Walking around Northern Hills is peaceful. You can't even tell it's right by some of San Antonio's busiest roads, which is why Shirley Sturgeon loves living here. Very quiet, very nice because it's mostly retired people. The quiet has kept Calvin Ingram in his home for 40 years. And the neighborhood is a friendly neighborhood. Even then, Northern Hills is not immune from crime. The biggest one that San Antonio police says they hear of are property crimes, like car break-ins. Ingram says someone rummaged through his cars parked in his driveway. We forgot to lock the vehicles. Nothing valuable was taken except Ingram's sense of security. Well, you feel violated. 
you, you feel violated. I mean, that's the only way I can put it, you know. But Safe officer Gregory Warrington says in the last month, San Antonio police investigated six car break-ins in Northern Hills. He says that number is low and encourages all victims to file reports. And it just helps us to, again, prosecute and get those individuals off the street. Even if it's something as minor as just shuffling through papers in your car. Yeah, uh, again, because somebody is going onto your private property, entering into your vehicle, that is a crime, right? So uh, make sure to report it. Twice a month, David Hadley patrols the neighborhood. You know, you just never know what you might stumble across next. He's a citizen on patrol. It's SAPD's Community Crime Watch program. That program could help that neighborhood with things like car burglaries because they know what to look for, right? Right, they can better identify potential issues. Um, they can educate their neighbors about, hey, this action that you're doing or the way that you're handling this might not be the best way to do it. Sometimes we'll be riding around and there'll be a window down. Well, that's not too good, so you just go knock on the door and tell them. It's a simple but meaningful gesture. The neighbors do look out for each other, which is helpful. Danielle Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. That story was part of our latest edition of our Know My Neighborhood series. Know My Neighborhood Northern Hills is now streaming on KSAT.com. If you think your neighborhood should be featured in our series, you can tell us why right now. Just scan the QR code on your screen and send us that invite. All right, heading back outside with live cam again. The cloud cover has been increasing temperatures in the mid 60s right now. That's going to lead way to a breezy Sunday with slightly more moisture in place. All right, really quickly, I do want to keep this on your radar. We are only 16 days away from the total solar eclipse happening on Monday, April 8th, around 1.30 p.m. Here's your fact of today. Only half of San Antonio will actually be in that path of totality. You can see it just bisects Bear County for the most part. The hill country in that path of totality, places like Stone Oak, the Rim, Holotus, even SeaWorld and Leon Valley, but the farther south and east that you go not necessarily in that path just expected to see a partial eclipse so hopefully praying for good weather monday april 8th speaking of the weather we're gonna have another check at that after the break well sometimes we can't get outside when the sun's setting because we're working right but at least we have KSAT Connect. We have our own little window <laughs> through all of you wonderful people who <laughs> sent in amazing KSAT Connect photos. Wow. You know we love a good sunset photo on this shift. Yes, this was sent in from our friend Taylor McClellan, Woodlawn Lake. Always Absolutely Woodlawn Lake. gorgeous. Wow. Here was the view over in Geronimo. Beautiful colors out there on the horizon. How about this one from the northwest side of San Antonio along I-10? Again, gorgeous coloring. This oh, one from pretty. Kennedy. And here's one from Lacoste, a perfect sunset wow. to a perfect day. So thank you to everybody that sent in those KSAT Connect photos. Right now, the big story heading into our Sunday is going to be the increasing wind gusts and also the humidity that's going to pump in as well. So right now, not necessarily clocking in any wind gusts here closer to San Antonio, but that is a little bit of a different story across the southern Edwards Plateau, closer to the Rio Grande, starting to already see some wind gusts in the 20 to 25 mile per hour range. I think max here in town around 30 to 35 miles per hour will be what we monitor for into our Sunday. You can see by 7 a.m. Already starting to see that breeze pick up, especially up into the hill country. 35 mile per hour wind gusts possible by the time we're waking up. And again, that breeze will continue through lunchtime and even in some way, shape or form into the afternoon. So just secure those loose lawn items. Make sure that those are secured before we head into the back half of the weekend's plans. So yes, those winds ushering in more of that moisture. We will see a touch more humidity return throughout the day tomorrow, but then we see a weak front move in and that knocks the humidity out Monday into Tuesday and even throughout a good chunk of next week that low humidity is going to continue so a slightly more pleasant feel in the forecast as well and this is the catalyst behind that boundary this area of low pressure that's going to continue tracking eastward here by Monday it's moved into the central plains it drops that weak front through south central Texas as it does so it also could spark up about a 30 to 40 percent potential at best first thing Monday 
Thursday morning to find some spotty rain, a quick round of it, maybe an isolated thunderstorm or two. So here's what that looks like on your future cast again tomorrow morning. We've got the cloud cover back in place for most of us. Some areas of patchy fog, maybe a sprinkle or two not ruled out throughout the first half of the day. And then that cloud cover sticking around for the most part into the afternoon. We'll call it mostly cloudy skies. After midnight, we start to look off to the hill country to our north and west. We are expected to catch the tail end of a line of rain and thunderstorms pushing across the state of Texas 5 to 9 a.m. That's our window here in San Antonio to see some of that spotty rain. So again, not a bad idea to take the umbrella with you for the Monday morning commute. Here's a look at one model. What rainfall totals could look like? Not very impressive. I'm thinking for most of us up to a couple of tenths of an inch at best for those that tap into the activity again mainly for folks along and north of highway 90 that's who's going to cash into this first thing monday before we clear things out and that's already on top of what we've seen over the past seven days just shy of six tenths of an inch here in town across our eastern counties hallisville picked up over two inches over the past week needed rainfall Again, not going to amount to a ton first thing Monday, but a little bit. Definitely a good thing to look forward to to kickstart the week. After that, beautiful, cool morning, cool morning, seasonable afternoons with high temperatures in the 70s. I'll take the 70s any day. Me too. All right. Thanks, Mia. Okay, Mary, we are keeping an eye on the UTSA women's basketball team. Yes, they just captured their first ever postseason win, and now they're off to Wyoming to meet the Cowgirls for a WNIT second round matchup. And the first ever San Antonio Sports All-Star Game goes down tomorrow. We'll tell you everything you need to know right after the break.